Jeremy Lubbock passed away January 29th, 2021. This interview with Richard Niles was recorded for the BBC in 2008 at Lubbock's home studio for Niles' documentary series, Richard Niles' History of Pop Arranging. Lubbock discusses his acclaimed compositions and arrangements for Rod Stewart, Michael Jackson, Chicago, Barbra Streisand, and work with producers Quincy Jones and David Foster. This is a unique opportunity to hear the thoughts of one of the greatest talents of our time. Radio Richard! Did I tell you about the Rod Stewart project? Yes, you did. And it uh, started out a little, little uh, bumpy. Um, style-wise, the record company wasn't quite happy with it. Which is partly because we started recording not live. We did a rhythm section date and then a string date, and I don't think it ever works. And I told them right from the beginning we should have done everything live, and everybody's playing together. So last Friday we did eight hours of just that, and we got nine tunes in eight hours. And it was, it was absolutely fantastic. I mean, it was, it was really as good as it gets. I was just thrilled all day, the way the musicians played it, because they were all playing together. And when the rhythm section hears all this going on, you know, they play differently. They just do. And then at the end, one of the songs we were going to do was um, What's New. I was amazed, A, that Rod knew it, and B, that he wanted to do it. So um, I said, that's great. So I suggested to him that to make a change on the album, why don't we do it with just the voice and no any strings and no rhythm section at all? And he thought that was a lovely idea. Well, you and I both know that it's a pretty complicated tune. So at the end of the session on Friday, we uh, ran it down and he got in a bit of a muddle with it. So... I said to him, well, come over to the piano and I'll take you through it and I'll show you, you know, a thing. So we ran through it and at the end the producer said, you guys have got to be kidding me. I said, why? He said, that is absolutely fantastic. And it ended up, and then I came back, this guy's known me 15 years. And he said, I had no idea you could play the piano like that. Well, I said, well, it just shows you, doesn't it? <laughs> it's all typecasting, you know, and if you veer out of your little pigeonhole, they, they don't seem to get the whole picture, you know. I mean, do you find, for instance, you're really well known as a string arranger? Do you find people say, oh, I hate, well, it's oh, my worst thing in the world is when I get introduced as a string arranger. No, that's not what I am. I just happen to do it a lot. But, you know, yeah. Well, just narrow down. You know, the, the more narrow they can make it, the more comfortable they are in. So, anyway, there. I mean, the thing that I've loved about being in America is that the, the, the variety of stuff that I do is absolutely amazing. I mean, it's gospel and Brazilian and, and rap and pop and classical and jazz and it's, it's pretty hard to get bored. When you came to America as an Englishman in LA, did you find uh, acceptance was easier because you were an outsider or not? Well, the thing about this town is, um, first of all, they love new blood always looking for new blood and secondly I don't think they really care where you come from as long as you can really deliver so if you're new and you can really deliver then it's 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 okay I I honestly don't know whether they liked it or didn't like it that I was English except that they liked the musical Englishness that I brought to American pop music. I mean, a lot of that stuff we did with Chicago, you know, is, which at the time everybody was saying, well, this is a new sound and all that, you know. It was because, because there was the influence of English music in it. And, and for obvious reasons, most American arrangers don't have that. You know, they're brought up on Aaron Copeland and I'm brought up on Elgar. There's a big difference. <laughs> Can you give an example of like when you were doing the Chicago sessions? Yeah, I'll tell you, the, the best example of all. This is a great story. You'll love this. Um, love Me Tomorrow. I mean, I don't know how well you remember, but love me. David Foster was the, was the producer. He said to me at the end of um, um, Love Me Tomorrow on the outro, can you do something um, Baroque? So I said, sure. So I did this kind of, it wasn't a few, but it sort of built up as it went along, you know. His Ertzatz Bach. When they came to mix the record, they loved it so much, they faded the band out and they left the string. Do you remember that? Well, about a year later, Chicago were in L.A. doing a concert at the amphitheater. 
and they decided that they would get a string search in and do some of the stuff that David and I had done with them. And one of the tunes they were going to do was Love Me Tomorrow. So the strings were up at the back of the stage, in, actually in a long line. I mean, it was a kind of silly layout, but it, it, it worked. And the band was down here behind me. Now, you have to understand that, that this was 6,000 people, heavy Chicago fans. So basically rock and rollers, right? So it got to the point in Love Me Tomorrow, they brought the lights and the sound down on the band, and they brought the lights and the sound up on us. And I was standing there conducting, and I could hear that the band is fading out. And then I hear this noise. I mean, that's all I can describe it as a noise. And it was actually quite like, what the hell is this? And I looked round, and the entire audience had stood up and cheered for this piece of Ertzatz bark. Which only proves the theory that I've had for years and years and years, that there are some bits of sort of classical music that, that in some strange way seem to be in the subconscious. And when they hear it, they, they go nuts because they practically never hear this stuff. And it was partly that, and I think it was partly that in a sense it was so out of context that they went, whoa! <laughs> and we were there three nights, and three nights they did exactly the same thing. It was absolutely amazing. Of course, needless to say, Chicago hated it. <laughs> oh, Peter Sotero was furious. Furious he was. <laughs> because you were getting Yeah, because, because they stood up when the orchestra played. <laughs> Yes. Uh, well, it was an event. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's an example. I mean, all right, so that's not English music, but it's European music. But, I mean, that, that points up another interesting thing about arranging. You, you created an event on the record, and you created an event on that concert. And yes. to a certain extent, that's what we're trying to do as arrangers. Aren't we, given half a chance? That um, I think one of our biggest frustrations is, is when producers try to prevent it being an event because they're, sometimes they're too insecure to, to allow it to be so uh, because they want to sort of put everything with the common denominator you know and it's um, um, I've, I've often said I mean I've been, so to speak out loud in, in public that my absolutely favorite clients are the black ones because I work with for some reason, which I never quite understood why, I, I seem to work with a lot of um, young black producers. I mean, really young, like 25 years old. And they are the best audience in the world. I mean, they're absolutely fantastic. If you write something really musical and really beautiful, they'll take it for what it is without thinking, oh God, well, you know, what is a record company going to say? And is it going to get on the radio and the thing? Because the rest of what they're doing is going to get on the radio. You know, the song and the performance and the rhythm section, that's going to get on the radio. I'm not going to stop it getting on the radio. And they're prepared, they're prepared to have decent music on their, on, their, on their cut and not think, oh, you know, we've got to keep it within these narrow parameters. Well, they, they can see what it's adding to their thing rather than thinking about it from an ego point of view of you getting the credit for something great on the record rather than them. I know. Well, yes, th that is partly it, but it's partly the fear. I mean, for instance, I, I did um, no names, but I did a, um, a record for somebody a couple of years ago. And there was one point in the song. I was doing it for a guy who's a, a songwriter producer. Um, he's quite a good friend of mine, but I, I, I don't like his songs. They're really pretty white bread. And he said to me on the date, he said, looking at the score, he said, you know what, we'll have to take out that major seventh there because it won't get on the radio. I thought, what are you talking about? Nobody's going to notice whether it's a <laughs> major seventh or not. And that sort of thinking, I mean, that's very, that's very white thinking. That's very, I mean, my experience in LA, that's very white thinking. And, uh, you know about that, and it, it can drive us nuts, that sort of stuff. I do indeed know about that you know? intimately, yes. Um, so when you're presented with a situation like that, what do you generally do? 
Well, there's not much you can do except just do whatever, you know. I mean, I, uh, I did actually acquire, in a way, unfortunately, I don't know whether it's unfortunate or not, but I did a, a, acquire a reputation of being very difficult because I will not always say, yes, of course, I'll do whatever you want, because I won't. Um, if I think they're making a really dumb suggestion, then I will, I will fight for it. But if it's not, even if I don't like it, if it's not really dumb, I'll... I mean, there was a situation on the Rod Stewart thing. I did... Um, the problem has been with the album is not to make everything sound the same because the parameters that we were given were tiny. I mean, I wasn't allowed to write the violins above the stave at all. Not Why? at all, no. Why? Because the record company said it sounds like film music. Well, that's Clive Davis. I mean, you know, what, what can I tell you? Um... So I was desperately thinking all the time, how can I make a variation? And one of the things that they loved, which I also love and I'm sure you love, is, is when cellos do um, like a, a counterline to, 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 uh, to the melody, you know, to the song. Um, and I did that and, 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 uh, on, on many occasions. And on one occasion on, on Friday, I had it for solo cello to make a difference. And he wouldn't buy it. He said, can I hear that with a section, please? I said, well, you can. So we overdubbed the section, and I know that when he mixes it, he'll put the section in, because it, it, it... I was about to try and explain that, but actually, on second thoughts, I can't, <coughs> I can't explain it. Was he producing? Yeah, but it's that sort of completely, you know, you take all the... Um, I spent between 1953 and 1970 playing... Um, in various places, clubs, hotels, things, you know, with a little trio, which was so, the, 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 only, the only way I can describe it, it was a kind of a Nat King Cole trio type thing. That sort of material, and I sang and all that stuff, you know. And then between 1961 and 1969, I was, believe it or not, in Africa. We won't go into why, but I was. And I ended up in Johannesburg. And I was still playing. It was a place I played there. And then I got the opportunity to do a couple of charts. And I was at any way at that point, I would realized that in terms of my skill, I was never going to get any better as a, as a piano player. I mean, that was it. I mean, I didn't have any more chops, you know, for me. And they weren't that great, believe me. So now I needed another instrument. And, uh, you know, since I've been brought up in that kind of, I mean classical music all the early part of my life. I've always loved it, you know, so I thought, well, this would be great. So I started out there. And then about a year later, I came back to England, and I did some work for the BBC. But basically, apart from one kind of series, late-night series I did, I, I really couldn't get arrested in London. It was really tough. Because... Um, I don't think I've ever been what, what the establishment calls a safe writer. I think they never quite knew what they were going to get. It wasn't absolutely predictable. And it wasn't completely safe from their point of view. And so and that's always difficult. You know. And then I met, I was doing a session at CTS, as then was in Wembley, remember, with a, a group called, do you know the King Singers? Sure. Yeah, I did a big orchestral thing with them. And I met a guy... He came in after me in the next session, in the afternoon session after me, and we met. And he was an American guy who at that time was like king of the jingles in, uh, in L.A. And we became great friends. He was a tremendous Anglophile, this guy. And uh, he, quite soon afterwards, you know, he said to me, you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. Why are you wasting your time over here? Well, it's, it's pretty scary to upstakes and go somewhere where you really don't have any connections. I mean, I knew... Apart from Don, who was just a friend, I knew one person here, literally one single person, who was a guy called Henry Louis, who was uh, Joni Mitchell's producer. And he, Henry was very good to me. He was also a friend of Don's, which is how I met him. I met him through Don. Uh, he was very good to me when I came out here. And um, he gave me some sort of demo things to do, one of which was so fascinating, was... Do you remember that Joni did a record of Charlie Mingus songs? Remember? Well, Charlie was in New York 
and at that time, you know, he was very ill. He had this Lou Gehrig's disease or whatever, you know, he was. So he sent the music to Joni so that she could write the lyrics. So now she's written the lyrics. So Henry calls me up and says, listen, we need to make a demo of this thing to send back to uh, Charlie. So I said, fine. Well, you know, luckily, having played jazz all those years, I knew all the changes and all that thing. So we made this, this, this demo of Rhodes and, and voice. And it was gorgeous. I mean, it was great. And uh, sent it off to New York. And about three weeks later, two or three weeks later, I come home from shopping one day. My, my then wife is standing on the doorstep of the house in a state of complete agitation. <laughs> I said, my God, what's happened? She said, you have to be at the airport in half an hour. I said, what's happened? She said, they want you in New York. Well, what happened was, apparently, they went off to New York, and they went through like five piano players, and Charlie didn't like any of them. And finally, he said, get me that guy in L.A. So that was a, I mean, that was a big thing for me. That was like a big break, you know. That was all, it was all due to Henry. And then the biggest thing was that, um, do you remember Minnie Ripperton? The last album she made, she was very ill and was in fact dying. And Henry took me to Minnie's house. She and her husband, Dick Rudolph, who's still to this day a huge friend of mine, and said that he thought that I should arrange the album. And I'm, you know, this guy just fallen off the back of a truck from London. <laughs> Nobody knew who the hell I was or anything, but I had a, a couple of tapes from London, you know. And God bless them. I mean, they gave me, the, I did the entire album. And that's, that's really, that's really what started, because that, from that came one other thing, and from that came Chicago. And that was your first uh, meeting with David Foster? No, actually, the first thing we did with David Foster was... Um, a thing for Denise Williams called Touch Me. Did you ever hear it? One of my favorite tracks. Did you? Oh, yeah. Touch Me Again. Absolutely. But I tell you what, I, 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 there's one thing I have to play, Richard, because if somebody was to say to me, what is your favorite thing that you've ever done as an arrangement? There's a song I did, unless you've heard it, for um, Julia Fordham called Shame. Have you heard it? No, I haven't. Well, it was strange. I was in London doing another gig and the day before I left I got a call from her then producer she said we'd love you to do this song so I said well I, I can't do it you know I mean I'm, I'm leaving town tomorrow well anyway come over to the studio and listen to it so they went over N nice song so I brought it home here and I wrote it and I sent the music to London and my brother conducted it John conducted it and um, I, I have to play it to you before, before you go because it is so insane. <laughs> I love it. But it was one of those wonderful things when you realize you have, it's a completely open field, you know, you can do anything you like. Um, but the Touch Me was the first one, and then after that came Chicago. Now, of course, something like Touch Me, you would have recorded live. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. Because interestingly enough, I was in L.A. at the time. No kidding. That, that year... And I was working on Leo Sayer's album with Humberto Gatica Engineering. Yeah, he and engineered uh, He engineered the, the thing. And he brought it to the studio. He said, I got to play you. This is the greatest track ever made. I got, this is just so wonderful. He played it for us. And that's where I was first oh really my exposed God. to your work. Yes, it was just me and David played the piano. And Denise sang. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, all music should be done like that. You know, I mean, those are the magic moments. And, and it's extraordinary that people how people continue to be surprised. You, you, you know the bass player, um, Nathan East, who is just a divine player. I remember years ago, I, I hired him to do a live session with Dionne Warwick. And I don't think he'd ever done one before. And this guy, who was as prominent as you can get as a bass player and has been around for years and has done every damn thing there is to do, he came to me at the end of the session. He said, I don't believe this. Why have I not been doing this for years and years and years? I said, well, unfortunately, first of all, it's not a great call to do him like this. I'm telling you, man, there's no other way to do music. And it was so interesting because I, I watched him in, in the session. He was sitting right, sitting right in front of me with his bass guitar. He, 
I mean, he quickly sussed what the part was. He didn't need, really need to look at it. And I mean, he spent the whole session, like, looking at everything that was going on and smiling. And every time the cellos played a lick or something, he'd smile. And it was so into what was, you know, it's just wonderful to watch. I had the exact same experience with him when I, I hired him to do a, a live 85-piece orchestra thing for the Pet Shop Boys. Right. And he did the same thing. Isn't he, he wonderful? Just, he just said, I never get the chance to do this. I know, I, I know. But it's funny how they sort of, they're always surprised by how wonderful it is. I did one with, I did one with Bonnie Raitt. I did the first orchestral date she'd ever done. She made a record with her dad, John Raitt. You know, he used to be a Broadway singer. And you're, you know, one of these. And I can't remember what the song was we did. And we very nearly didn't do it because she was too nervous about seeing him in the orchestra because she thought she'd make a fool of herself or, I don't know, some damn thing. I mean, it just wiped her out. She said, I can't believe this. Why don't I do this all the time? I did it with Dolly Parton, too. Do Dolly was so funny. She was so nervous. She brought a bottle of brandy to the session. <laughs> and it was what we did, White Christmas, live. She was so nervous, poor thing. But it went just great. She absolutely loved it. And it's just that they never got a chance to do it, you know. I mean, guys like you and me know that's the only way, decent way to make music, you know. Let's talk a little bit about, I mean, you get different things to do. Sometimes you're arranging the whole track, and sometimes you're overdubbing. Mostly overdubbing. Okay. Mostly. So let's, let's take your working process from when you get sent a track. I, whatever I get sent, I re-record onto my cassette thing there, and I pop it in that little machine that is right there next to the roads. I do every piece of arranging I do, I do on the roads, never on this. Because there's a, there's a purity to the sound of the roads, and it doesn't matter whether it sounds like strings or what it sounds like, but there's a sort of purity that, that you really hear the music truly. Sometimes with this stuff, you know, it gets like too processed or something. And anyway, I'm comfortable with that. I'm just so used to it, you know, and I, I put the thing in there and the headphones on and off I go and just write to the track. That's basically what I do. And that's it. Do you, now, do you, um, obviously you're a pen and paper guy. Oh, absolutely. Except when I do, I mean, over here is where, where I do my demos for songs and, and stuff. And, and then I can, I just play it right into the, you know, performer. Um, but for any, any live orchestral recording, it's always, the, always, always over there, pen and pencil. Yeah. And, uh, I assume you you have a copyist, a number of them. No, I have this firm. firm you know, I meant I tell you one thing that I was really lucky about is that very soon after I came to LA, I mean very soon. So we're talking twenty years ago more. I found the copyist I still have. I found the contractor I still have. And I found the greatest concert master that's ever been, who unfortunately has since died. But I've got a good one now. And I just had the same team forever. I mean, just wonderful. Let's talk about how important a good relationship with a concert master is. It's absolutely vital. Can you explain for those people in East Grinstead who don't understand what a concert master is, how he helps you? Well, the concert master is is the leader of the orchestra in in, in the sense that he's the leader of the string section, and therefore, being the biggest section of the orchestra, he's the leader of the orchestra. And your question is, what does it take to be a really good concertmaster? Obviously, the fact that you have to be a really wonderful player. Secondly, you have to have the total respect of the members of the orchestra. Now, the first one I had was a guy called Jerry Vinci, who was a legend in this town. And he was a very crusty Italian. He was a very bad-tempered, opinionated Italian. but one of the greatest musicians you'll ever meet. And one of the reasons they played so wonderfully well for him, they were all a little bit frightened of him, because they knew that if they didn't come up to scratch, he would just bite their heads off right then and there, you know. I mean, I've seen him do it to producers on a date, you know. Tell them their fortune on a date. It didn't go down great very well, but it was amusing to see. <laughs> um, and he was... It's very hard to describe, but it's... 
the really, really, really great musicians that I work with, they, what I call, they always get it. Whatever it is that's going on, they get it. And they react to it. So if you write something really juicy, the ones that really get it, they look up from the part and they smile at you while they're playing. Now, I mean, the, the, the guy who leads my uh, violist is the, is the uh, principal violist of the Philharmonic here, a guy called Evan Wilson, who's the most amazing. He's got to be one of the best viola players in the world. And he always gets everything I write. Jerry used to get, I mean, he used to look up from the part and smile at me if something really juicy went by. <laughs> and a lot of them don't. They just sit there and play, you know. I think that's important because otherwise it's the difference between playing the notes and playing the music. And that is totally vital. In what way can a concert master help you? Like, for instance, my, my guy always says... Well, he, he, I, I tell you what, it means that I don't, have to, I don't have to dot every I and cross every T because he'll do it for me. So when the Domingo says to quadruple pianissimo, he makes damn sure they do it. Because these guys, you know, half the time they leave their brains at home when they come to work, these string players. I mean, I love them, but oh God, they can drive you nuts. And he wouldn't let that happen. And it's taken me, since he died, which is quite some time ago, it's taken me all that time, years, 10 years, to get the orchestra that I've got now. Through very careful weeding out and getting the right people. And, and now, now they, they play what's on the page. I don't have to keep saying to them, Will you please play the dynamics? You know, I don't have to do that anymore. What is interesting is that the my group of choice is only 20 players. And what's interesting about that is um, that after I'd, uh, when I realized that I finally had got the orchestra that I wanted, I remember, well, we did a session that was so magical, I realized that everything had fallen into place. And the next week I did a session for a client who wanted a bigger section. So I went back to what I had previously done, which is about 28 or 30. It wasn't nearly as good. So now it doesn't matter what it is. I mean, unless it's, unless it's Barbara, you know, then you've got 50. Then, it's the, then that's a whole different story. But otherwise, stay with the chamber group because they just, they just all play wonderfully well. And uh, if the engineer's good, you know, and, I mean, I pretty much dictate how they mic the, the strings, and then they, if they're mic'd right, then they sound right, you know. But they just, they just play wonderfully well. The guy I've got now is a very good young, young concert master. I mean, there'll, there'll never be another Jerry Vinci. It's like a one-off, you know, like Leonard Bernstein. There'll never be another one. Um, but it's, it's, it's skill, authority, and the ability to really get inside the music. Because then you'll inspire. I mean, there was a very, very interesting thing happened. Um, I didn't give you a copy of my album, did I? Or did I? I'm waiting. Oh, I didn't give you one? <laughs> no. No. I made it six years ago. I'm still looking for a label to put it out. We did it with the London Symphony Orchestra, and my brother conducted. Now, this guy is a fantastic musician, and I'm not given to saying that unless it's really true, even if it's my brother. He really is. He's quite exceptional. And the album is, um, there's nothing fast on it. It's all rather slow, meditative, atmospheric. Well, not at atmospheric. Well, you'll see when you hear it. And they have two concert masters, the London Symphony. One of them is an absolutely wonderful girl called Janice Graham. And about the third day of recording, we were all in the pub having lunch or something. I said, Janice, how, how do you guys know when to come in? Because John's not beating time. Because it's the, with that sort of music, the really good conductors working with a really good orchestra don't have to beat time. And as John explains it, and the orchestra loves it because it tells the orchestra that, they tr that he trusts them. So I said, Janice, how the hell do you all come in together? She says, simple, I just go like this, and they all start playing. 
But you've got to be, you know, that's being a concert master so that you really control the I mean, the playing on this, we wait till you hear it. There's some playing on that thing that is so breathtaking. Strings. I mean, like, like when you don't hear the end of a, you, there is no end. It just sort of suddenly isn't there. And there's no beginning to something. And it's just, God, it's, I mean, that really takes some doing. And that is the concert master does that. And it was really interesting to watch because what John was doing, I've often wondered really how to describe it, but it's almost like he's sort of sculpting the music in the air. He's, it's, it's just encouraging the music to come out without actually being a conductor. I don't know what he was. It's almost like not being a conductor, but, but being something or other. I don't know, but it's... It, uh, you know, you asked me what makes a good um, concert master. Another good question is what makes a good conductor. And I think the main thing about a good conductor is to make the musicians want to play. Really want to play. And this is how you get good results. And that's what he did. And you can you can hear it in the music. You know, it's I look and he to did he did the thing I'm going to play you the the Ju Julia Fordham. He conducted that, and there's actually magical moments in it. So, uh, presumably, if he's there and you're here and you've got to do a gig, you conduct it yourself. Oh, I conduct it, yes. I'm a, I'm a sort of uh, workhorse conductor, you know. I'm, I'm getting better, but I'm not... <laughs> I'm not like he is. You know. That's his job. Here's a little question. How does the pop arranger differ from any other kind of arranger? They don't. They don't. Uh, what was it Ellington said? There's only two kinds of music, good and bad. And that's about, that's about the size of it. I mean, I think arrangers have all kinds of skills. I mean, some are obvious skills, like you have to be a good enough musician and you have to know the technique and you have to know the instruments and, and all that stuff. But probably the most important thing is that you have to very quickly recognize the context in which you're working and work accordingly. Now, that's not to say that sometimes you can't make rather interesting juxtapositions, unlikely. I mean, I, I'll never forget that years ago, I did a thing for the Four Tops. Um, I'd never worked for them before, and Holland and Dozier wrote the song, so they were also involved. And it was actually, it was many years ago, and it was one of my first forays into the black music world. And they gave me this absolutely stunning track. I mean, it was to die for, this thing. And the, and the song was interesting. It was called Sail On. And it was the metaphor. It was a sort of maritime metaphor for somebody's relationship, marriage or whatever. So they give me the track, and I think, now, wait a minute, what am I going to do here? There's, I have two alternatives. One is to do the sort of traditional Motown-type, you know, strings that we all know, you know. Or we do some sort of maritime impressionist thing. So, well, anyway, to cut a long story short, I did a sort of Ravel Debussy, I don't know what, sort of like just spooky shit, like hanging in the air, you know, this. Well, I'll never forget. <laughs> we, I, I rehearsed the orchestra, and then I said to the guys in the booth, okay, t t turn on the tape recorder, we'll, we'll do one out. So I did it, and we did the take, and I came back in the control room, and there was these like eight or ten um, black guys standing around going, I mean, and I thought, uh-oh, I'm in serious trouble here. Not a bit of it. They could not get over the fact that they hadn't got what they were expecting. But they got this thing, whatever it was, that they'd never heard before, that sort of, I don't know, just point, pointed up this, this metaphor they had. But I think that's an exception. I think on the whole, you have to be very conscious of the context in which, in which you're working. And... Uh, I mean, obviously, I write differently for Streisand than I do for Madonna. Well, give an example of that. Well, d did you ever hear the stuff I did for um, um, Dick Tracy? Uh, I saw the movie. 
Well, I did all, this, all the, the... Pat Leonard was the producer. I did all the stuff for that. And um, I've done some other stuff for it on a records. I did a thing called This Used To Be My Playground. But you know, the songs are so different. The, I mean, first, the artist is completely different, but the songs are very different, so you're, you're going to write differently, you know? I think, I mean, Barbara stuff is much more traditional, you know, traditional, timeless pop, but Madonna tends to be sort of cutting edge, and that's what she's looking for, you know? And with her, it's a crapshoot anyway. You go and do the date, and then they take your score, and they cut it into little pieces, and they put it wherever they want it, you know? So, I mean, you know, whatever. <laughs> what about the aspect of uh, coming up with hooks? One of the things that I'm most thankful for, and I don't know why this is true, Richard, is that when I get a new track from somebody, I mean, it doesn't matter what kind of music it is, I have the intro written in about five minutes. It's like, it's almost like a sort of instant reaction to what I'm hearing will tell me what to do, you know. I mean, I don't want, we, we, we don't want to get too philosophical about all this, I mean, unless you want to, but, but I mean, I have a theory about this whole business. I don't think, uh, most of what we write, I don't think we write at all. I think we're just messengers. And I think that's an example. I think, I think whatever it is comes down the pipe at that point that says, write this intro, comes down the pipe. You don't have to sit and think about it. It just comes down the pipe, bang, and there it is. And, there, and then when you're, when you get into the song and you're looking for these lines and things, they, they sort of write themselves. You know, I never think, I don't think I ever think, oh, I better have a hook here. I write whatever it is that I hear that I think will be good at that point, and sometimes it turns out to be a hook, and sometimes it doesn't, and whatever, you know? Well, I think that's one of the, one of the ways that uh, you get the best results, because I always, when people ask me, I always say I write the first thing that comes into my head, because it it's is, always the best idea. It, thank you. It's almost always the best. If you agonize over something, it's not any good anyway, so don't bother. No, there are occasions, and I'm sure you've done this, there are occasions when most of it comes out in one piece, but I have been known to spend eight hours on four bars of music because looking for the absolutely perfect voicing in, in a particular given situation, it's a sort of completely anal, stubborn, whatever, get it you know but it's it's wonderful when you finally do get it because you know it's, it's I mean what is music it's about choices that's all it's about can you give an example of that no I honestly don't think I can okay. I mean, I, no I, I don't think I could remember any moment you know any like four bar moment that uh, no I don't think I can um, let's talk briefly about changing things in the studio first of all God, I spent spent Friday doing that Thank God these days, the, the whole art of copying is so amazing. I mean, they, they, one of the tunes we did, they changed key twice on me. But my copies comes with his computer and his little keyboard and his printer. And in five minutes flat, he had printed out a new set of parts. Otherwise, we'd have been in the doghouse. Um, yes, I mean, I can do that. You know, I can do it, I can do it r really quick. I mean, a lot of what I was asked to do the other day was pretty silly, but it's, you know, whatever. <laughs> if that's what you want. Um, this is a silly question, but the funniest thing that's ever happened to you on a session? Funny ha-ha, funny peculiar? Both. Either. Well, one of my favorite stories, well, actually, I. I'm not sure this is publishable there. You may have to turn the camera off. Well, yeah, but then just don't use the names. Right. I will not use names. An extremely famous, an extremely experienced lady was doing a live session one day. And we have to remind ourselves that she had been doing this particular thing for 25, 30 years. And the t I forget what the tune was, but I remember that what the routine was. 
There was a nice little orchestral introduction, and then the first eight bars of the song was her and the strings, and on the second eight bars, at, at the second eight bar, the rest of the orchestra came in. I mean, the, the rhythm section came in. I had Vinnie Caluta playing drums. He's probably the best drummer in the world. Um, and probably Nathan and Randy Warburton and I, who knows, you know. So, and it's a gentle little song. So when he comes in, the second eight bars, a little hi-hat, little cross stick. And she says into the microphone, what is that? It sounds like somebody hitting something. I said, yes. It's called a drummer. <laughs> I mean, I thought the orchestra was going to wet itself because this person who's been working with drummers for 30 years says, what is that? It sounds like somebody hitting something. It's a good moment, that was. Let's talk about um, how technology has in any way altered what you do over the years from when you started to now? If I'm writing for live instruments, it hasn't affected me at all. Not at all. But I do like sometimes mixing the two. Mixing live with this. And it can be, it can be very effective, very effective. So in that sense, it's, um, it's broadened the palette. That it definitely has done. But it hasn't altered the way I, I, I write. And in fact, so much so that um, I am asked on occasions, I was asked on, the, on this project, um, can you make us demos of your charts? And the answer is no, I cannot and I will not. And the reason I will not is because I cannot possibly do on here what you're going to hear on there. And so I'm not going to shoot myself in the foot by giving you a false impression. So I, I won't, won't do it. I've said the exact same words mm. myself. They, they, they sometimes ask for it, but I just say no. 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 And I'm, I mean, you're, you're the same, you know, the amount of work you know. I say, no, listen, you know. You know who I am. If you can't trust me by now, then maybe you're calling the wrong person. Yeah, or I say, if you want to pay me double, then I'll take the time to program it. And yeah, but I won't even do that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, I agree. I, I thought about that for a while, but I won't even do that because it's just, you, you can't do it. I mean, it just isn't the, it doesn't, it's not the same. When you were starting doing pop records, mm. what other arrangers had you admired that you felt, gee, I like that, maybe I'm... Well, it depends what you mean by pop arrangers. I mean, my favorite arranger who's ever lived, apart from Gil Evans, which is something very specialized, was Don Costa. In my opinion, the greatest record that Frank Sinatra ever made was a record called Sinatra with Strings, which is a complete misnomer because it was the whole orchestra. It wasn't just strings. That was the record on which he did the verse of Stardust and not the chorus. Do you remember that? And the absolutely... If I had to say, if I was absolutely forced to say, what's the greatest arrangement you've ever heard in your life? I'd have to say that it's Don Costa's Come Rain or Come Shine off that record. Do you remember that one? I mean, I'll never forget the first time I heard that. I loved him. Of course, I loved Riddle. Um, I'd love some of what Sebesky did at one point. Um, I loved some of Mandel. I very much liked the um, Jobim record that Klaus Ogerman did with them. Um, though God knows what happened on this Diane Kroll record. Have you heard it? So boring. And God knows what's going to happen now, man. Nobody's learning the, the art. It's a wonderful story. I went to a music store just several years ago, a place on Sunset where in those days people used to buy their tapes and things called Project One. And um, when I made my purchase, I gave my credit card to the young man behind the desk. And he looked at the credit card and he said, oh, you're Jeremy Lover. Oh, good. I've just come down from uh, Berkeley. Um, I'd love to come to you for, for um, some, uh, you know, whatever. 
I said, well, that's very nice, but I, I, I must tell you that I actually don't teach because I tried it once and I discovered that I was an extremely bad teacher. Partly because I don't know how to articulate what it is I do and B, because I have absolutely no patience whatsoever so that they don't get it right away. It's a disaster. So I thought it's better not even to try. And the guy said to me, no, 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 he said, I only want to come to you two or three times. And I said, listen, mate, you've got 15 years to spare, I'll teach you. And this guy really thought he was going to come to me two or three times. I don't know what he thought I was going to give him, little little gimmicky things that he could take, you know, and, and insert in his... And that's, you know, that's pretty much, that's pretty much it. They don't realise what's involved. And I don't know where the next arrangers are coming from. I really don't. Well, uh, that points up something which I've pointed out to a few of the people I've been talking to. Um, it seems that today we have a different musical infrastructure. I mean, in the old days, when, as I guess when you were starting out, right. record companies were run by music-loving entrepreneurs who adored music and were, and because of that, innovative, creative records were made. Today, we have multinational companies. We have mostly artists who are clones of other artists. We, and it would seem that, you know, you talk about the Diana Krall record being safe and... Uh, it's supposed to be a jazz record. I rest my case. D well, most, most, the, what is... Almost everything that's wrong with our business was encapsulated in that meeting I had at the Bel Air Hotel the other day. Almost everything you'd like to mention. Lawyers pretending to be musicians and managers who should be m managing a farm, not an artist. I mean, it was astounding. No wonder they make such bad records. It's so boring. Yeah, it's changed a lot, man. I mean, the, the days of Liebes and CBS, I mean, that was... No wonder they made such great records. <laughs> do you see... Do you GRP see? was good for a while when Grusin were there, you know. Um, sorry, you were going to ask me something? No, no, that's, that's really... But now... Well, I'll give you an example. I mean, my record, my record is, a, is a perfect example. It came about because I, I, I met a guy who used to work at Sony in New York. We were doing some other project together, and he was in my studio, and uh, I, for some reason or other, I played him, whatever. And he said, oh, my God, we have to make a record of his stuff. And I've been around the business long enough to know, come on, Tony, you've got to be kidding, man. Nobody's going to buy this stuff. It's all, like, esoteric, who knows what. And he said, no, 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 I'm serious. So anyway, cut a long story short. We gathered material. This is, I mean, some of it was quite old, but stuff that had been around. And, you know. and he took it. To his to 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 Donny Einer at uh, Columbia, and Donny Einer is a kind of a street thug, but the way he sold it to him was that this would be a very good prestige album for the label to balance everything. So Donny Einer agreed to it, and I mean I think Tony was incredibly brave to do this. A guy called Tony McEnany. That record cost three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I mean, that's a lot of money for an esoteric record. And apparently, to hear Tony say they were all excited about this, and it was wonderful. We get off to London, the London Symphony Orchestra, and all this stuff, you know. One month after we got back from London, Tony went to see him and let him listen to some stuff, and he walked in for the meeting, and Tony said, "Oh no." Forget it, man. I'm not interested anymore. I've got more important things to do. And that was it. I mean, <coughs> hello. <laughs> You've just spent all this money and you, you know. Amazing. Then Sony Classic wouldn't touch it because they didn't know whether it was classical music or pop or what the hell it was. See, again, you see, you don't have the parameters. They don't know what to do. The music business sucks. I mean, it really, really, really does. It's I'll quote you on absolute... That. I was going to say it's a jungle. It's not a jungle. It's an absolute cesspool is what it is. It really, really is. I mean, it is... Well, I mean, you know, well, a bit... Except you don't work here, but what goes on here is just terrifying. 
It attracts all the wrong kind of people who are in it to make a quick buck. And none of them should be dealing in a commodity that they know absolutely nothing about. They should be out selling carpets or shoes or something. Because that's about as much as they care about the product that they're dealing with. And I, I take every possible opportunity I can, which isn't very often, to tell them, which they don't like at all. I said, you guys have to realize one thing. We can work without you. We can make music. You, without us, you have diddly squat. Precisely zero, have you? Because you have no product. Ah, oh, yes, but, you know, <laughs> some silly argument. But it's true. One thing I didn't get a chance to ask you about, because yes. we touched on it, but, I mean, David Foster is not a bad arranger himself. No. So, therefore, that's a kind of interesting thing when another arranger hires you or wants to work with you. How does that relationship work? Because David would never have the patience to sit in front of a piece of paper with a pencil. I mean, we always had a running joke, you know, um, that he would ask me to do something. I mean, he said, come out to the studio and I'll show it to you and stuff, you know. And he'd play me the track. And then he'd play me this sort of synth crap that he put all over. He does strings and things, you know. And after a while, after I'd been doing this for a couple of years, I said to him, David, why do you bother to do this? Because you know when I go home, I'm not going to take the slightest bit of notice of anything you've told me. And I was, and he'd sort of giggle and say, yes, well, that's, and that's why he hired me, because he knew that I was going to think of things that he would never think of. You know? And he, 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 he just wouldn't take the time to look at the voicings and look at the... I mean, it's... Does he uh, either program or handle the, the rhythm part? Oh, yeah, he doesn't you're over Oh, I don't do that, no. No, he's brilliant at that. Daddy's brilliant at that. Just out of selfishness, because I was telling you, you know, my connection with Clive Griffin. Can you talk a little bit about, I mean, that was a Grammy-winning arrangement. Can you talk a bit, little bit about just putting together that? Yes, particular? actually, it was quite, it was quite interesting, actually. Um, David called me late one night. He was doing the rhythm track to it, late one night. He said, man, you've got to come out here and show me the changes of this thing. So that's, that's me, that's basically me playing the keyboards on that thing. It's not him. And this is, it's always amazes me, you know, because he's, he's a phenomenal musician, David. Really phenomenal. And every night again, their mind goes completely blank. They can't figure out, um, they just can't, they just can't hear what it is. And, you know, and I w went over to the studio and I played, and he said, oh, yes. Yes, it was fun doing that. I liked that one a lot. One of the better ones. So you would have put down like a, I mean, just in terms of working method, you would have worked out the, the basic thing. Yes, the, the basic with yeah, him. Yeah, the, the changes and stuff. Yeah. Then would he have programmed up? He would have played the bass. He's frankly, he's wonderful on the move bass. He's really great on that. And he would have either drum programmed it or got somebody in. I, I, I truthfully, I forget now which which it was. And then we would have done the strings, and then he would have. Tarted up with bells and all that sort of, you know, usual stuff. You know. Again, you've done a lot of work with Quincy, or some work with Quincy. Not a lot. Um, actually, my worst moment in my entire career in Los Angeles was when he hired me to do four arrangements for Off the Wall and threw them all out. When he called me to do them, I thought, I am made. And when he threw them out, I thought, I better go back to England. <laughs> Which luckily I didn't have to do, but, uh, but he forgave me. And then we did that piece for uh, the Olympics. Do you, do you remember Grace? Do you know what Grace? Grace, have you heard that? We did The Color Purple. That, now that's a story. He 
as you may or may not remember, was also one of the producers of the movie. And I think it's true to say that his life was in something of a disarray at that time. So I remember the whole sequence of events so clearly. On a Friday night, I had just finished work with Barbara on the Broadway album. And as you probably know, that can put five years on your life right there. And I was wiped. I mean, completely wiped. Next morning, 10 o'clock in the morning, Quincy calls. He says, man, I, I, I really need you. I need you to come over. And I said, fine, Q. Well, I'll tell you what. I'll be there on Tuesday. No, man. He said, you don't understand. I said, well, what don't I understand? He said, you've got to come now. I said, you've got to be kidding, man. I just left Barbara last night. I'm like wiped. He said, well, I don't know what to tell you. I... So anyway, cut a long story short. He's just left his wife, and he's holed up in the, in the Bel Air Hotel, and he's got this suite at the Bel Air Hotel, and in one of the rooms are all these synthesizers and all this stuff, you know. And he obviously is going to write the music for Color Purple, since he's the producer. But he always needs somebody to, like, sit there and play and so he can yes or no it, you know, and all that stuff. You know. Well, they'd used as a temp track throughout the movie, the shooting of the movie, they'd used a piece of music by George Delarue called Cross Creek. And the word came from Stephen that that's what he wanted. He wanted something like Cross Creek. So we started to try and write something like Cross Creek. Then we'd, we'd do something and send the cassette over to Amblin, where Stephen was, and then he'd come back with notes or something, you know. And again, to cut a long story short, it, as each version went on, it got closer and closer to Cross Creek. And I said to Quincy, Q, attention, we're going to be in dead trouble in a minute. Well, man, I want to say, that's what Stephen was. I said, Quincy, look, you are the most prominent musical man in the entire world at the moment. Why don't you tell Steven Spielberg to shut up and just give him some decent music? Oh, man, I can't do that. And all this stuff went on, you know. So we wrote these themes that were ludicrously close to Cross Creek. And uh, George Delarue sued and got a million dollars. And I said to them, I told you so. I mean, it was really silly. And it was very intense. I mean, I was in his room for two weeks, 18 hours a day and two weeks. It was like he was on the edge of a nervous breakdown. It was really hairy. But... Uh, when I asked Jeremy about his use of quartal voicings, voicings in fourths, this was his reply. The harmonic environment is very much my own, and is one that people say makes my stuff so recognizable. But being a self-taught musician, I have frankly no idea what a quartal voicing is, nor do I want to know. My writing is purely instinctive. I never write a sketch. I start at bar one and keep going to the end. In some curious way, it seems to write itself. I think the use of dynamics is common to all music. It's something that creates mood and drama. Counterpoint is also common to most good music. Likewise, the use of various registers also creates mood and drama. The art of arranging is to make the singer and the song much better than they are on paper. And the use of counter melodies often helps to enhance the meat of the original melody. They can also create a harmonic emphasis by bringing out the important note or notes inherent in any harmonic context. All good music also has a very strong sense of climax. You have to choose the peak moment of any score and work your way to it in a logical and smooth way. It's impossible to say exactly how this is done because it will vary somewhat from piece to piece. Suffice to say that there are many devices that can be used. Texture, weight, movement, spread, controlled dissonance, and others. The real secret of all complex music is to make it sound inevitable, in the sense that it sounds natural and that there is no other way it could be done. 